Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for the first ever DevOps Loop at VMworld. My name is Christy Lynham, and I will be the moderator for the It's DevOps, the SECA silent panel discussion. Security is showing up in new ways as a part of modern application delivery. So in this discussion, we'll be exploring what's not working today and what a good practice for shifting left and guaranteeing application security at the earliest stages of development lifecycle looks like. We have a fantastic group of panelists joining us today. So first of all, panelists, thank you so much for being here and for being part of this discussion. Um, and I would like to take a second to introduce each of you and have you tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, so let's start with David. Welcome. Hi, y'all. Yeah, David Zenzian. Um, if you joined my lightning talk, you know a little bit more about me already, but I am the Tanzu Field CISO, and I come from a history of non-product business, where I actually was a, a security practitioner for about 30 years, doing every type of security throughout the system. And nowadays, I, I have these wonderful conversations with businesses and how do we actually streamline uh, modern enterprise, enterprise security. Awesome. Thanks so much for being with us, David. Uh, Dominique, hi. Hello, hello everybody. Um, I'm, I'm Dominique Top. I have done a talk earlier today uh, about my career journey. It was a lot of fun. Um, I, uh, I'm currently a solutions engineer at HashiCorp and it, as part of my job, I talk about uh, security stuff a lot. We have a lot of um, zero trust security um uh, philosophies and and over the years in my my endeavors with a lot of meetups i've, I've um frequented a lot of um dev sec ops and security related things know a lot of people in the space that uh i uh respect and um yeah hopefully i can uh <laughs> i can come with an opinion or two awesome thanks so much dominique and last but not least we have lee Kapili with us hey lee Hi friends, so excited to be uh, with all of you. Uh, I'm Lee Kapili. Uh, I started out my career as a developer, uh, mainly writing software for automation and operations stuff, uh, doing private cloud type things, and uh, eventually got into the conference circuit where I graduated from infrastructure engineering to being a developer advocate. Uh, so recently I joined the Tanzu team here at VMware uh, as a developer advocate. Um, I've done a lot of security implementations and I've always had a security niche, uh, starting off with doing capture the flag competitions. Uh, eventually I wrote the MTLS implementation for Kubernetes, uh, part of the Kubernetes project. And uh, recently I wrote up a Flux security model for the Flux project. Super excited awesome. to be here about DevSecOps. Yeah. So excited to have all of you. Um, okay, so before we dive right in, let's take just a few minutes to cover some housekeeping details so that we're all on the same page about how this is gonna work and how you all as attendees can ask questions to our panelists. Um, so we have about 55 minutes um, dedicated to this discussion, but depending on engagement, it's possible we could end a little early. Um, but just know that if you saw any of our panelists speak earlier in the day and you have questions about anything they said or anything you want to know, now is the perfect time to ask those questions. All right, so that brings us how to how do we ask this, the questions. Um, so if you will join the Slack channel in the sidebar, um, it is called Panel Discussion. It's DevOps, the SEC is silent. Um, and so there are a couple of different options when it comes to asking questions. Questions can be asked in Slack, or there will also be an opportunity for you to be pulled on stage to ask your question live if you would like to. Um, if you prefer not to come on stage and ask your question live, you can just type it in our designated Slack channel, and I, as the moderator, will be happy to ask it for you. On the other hand, if you do want to ask your question uh, live to the panelists yourself, tell us in Slack that you would like to ask it live. And if our Slack moderators think that your question is super good, then they will DM you on Slack and get you to join us on stage and they'll get you all set up. Um, so just be sure to keep an eye on your Slack DMs. Um, last housekeeping note before we get started, um, just be sure to stick around for DevOps party games that will be taking place right after um, our panel discussion starting at 4.30 Eastern. Um, and I think, I believe one of our panelists Dominique may have to leave a little bit early to get set up for DevOps games, but no worries. The rest of us uh, will continue this conversation right here and we'll join her um, right after panel discussions. Um, so what do you say we jump right in for our first question? Let's do it. All right, um, cool. So someone make the case that there's enough new stuff in security 
to start using a term like DevSecOps. You get a free virtual cookie for whoever wants to answer. I'll go ahead and start because if you look at the history that we've dealt with in security, we are still solving the problems that we had 40 years ago in security in many ways. The processes that we do things may have changed, but overall, you know, we're, if you look at the OWASP top 10 over the last 15 years, we have what, four new items in 10 years? It really is, nothing has, has changed, but our methodology and our, our mindsets have changed. And I think that's a big piece of what we're seeing now is the ability to handle this parallel processing of, of events and, and, and knowing that it's not a static path from beginning to end and we can go back and loop around is that 3D path that was talked about earlier. Um, I think that's a really interesting, interesting way of looking at it from my point of view. Yeah, as far as uh, the problems that we're solving, right, uh, in security, we're always thinking about trust. And I think a very interesting developing area of the industry right now is trusted computing. Uh, when we think about DevOps, which is the collaboration, the culture, the habits, the team making around building software together, not just the software, but the shipping of that software, the systems architecture of that software. We talk about putting together the system side and the problem solving side. And there is a whole category of issues around trust that come with determining that the software that you want to run is running on the machines that you want it to run on, machines that you trust, machines that come from hardware that came from places that you trust. Uh, and with the Spiffy project and all of this kind of evolving standard in trusted computing, there's a lot of process that doesn't exist. There are compliance protocols that don't exist yet. And uh, we've got to evolve the field a little bit. So I think that there's a pretty good justification there already. And that's just one category of uh, of trusting the chain. Yeah. I absolutely agree with you, David. Um, with regard to the number of new problems that you have, right? It's, it's it, people have understood the limitations that you you are you run into when you try to glue things together. Uh, and we're still figuring out ways to attack and retool our solutions to those understood problems. Well, maybe I can ask Dominique also, because you talked about your history of your, your how you've, you've evolved yourself. And this is, from my point of view, again, I only know my own, my own world, my own point of view is, is it's, it's the chance that we can empathize with these other roles and people are having, you know, in, in the past, security will take things from a, a risk mitigation point of view, like you're doing a threat analysis, we look at things and do specifically looking at the model, but they weren't part of the team. So the next features coming down the line, they, they didn't have the understanding or the understanding of the methodology, the, the, the idea that security teams are just now learning DevOps, you know, they, they don't have many security developers, or this SRE lifecycle. So the tooling of that is important, but also on the developer side, you know, the consumers of their applications, are not just the customers, but also these SRE teams and the security teams. And are they writing the applications for the interface on that? How do we empathize with each of those teams around it? And, and I, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't think that it's new, but it's a, it's a new way that we approach this problem with what we've learned. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's, you know, I, I know I know a bunch of people who, calls, who call themselves DevOps, uh, DevSecOps engineers, um, but I also, as I said, know a lot of people in the security field and, um, you know, there is still a really big disconnect with what they think they want and what they think they need. And there's not much communication there. And, um, you know, if you're going to some sort of like uh, um, the uh, platform engineering type style um, model, you know, if there's a if there's if there's a whole big team of security just sitting there somewhere and like coming up with the policies and coming up with the things, there's this this classic thing where people say like, oh, I'm writing stuff. And then security says no. But, you know, that I think DevSecOps as a thing, you know, like I think everybody should obviously focus on like making sure that your applications are secure and compliant and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I feel like the there should be more communication. Everything should be like in harmony and everybody should understand what the other party wants. Like, you know, I think we've done a very good job with having 
developers understand what operations need and the other way around. Like there's a lot of like coming together of it. Like they underst people understand a bit more about what is necessary. But when it comes to security, I feel like there is a big, oh, it's us against them kind of thing. And I think that would be coming towards everything now. It's not, as I said, not as you said, not new, but I think that is something that we should all focus a bit more on. Does that make sense? <laughs> No, it, it made sense to me. And, and Lee, I mean, you, you've been part of the, the CNCF projects. I mean, is are you seeing that shift too? Because I'm I'm feeling by watching the the you know especially Inspire, you know, watching where that's coming from and zero trust model of how do we actually get to kind of the opposite of what you said. You know, we you, you mentioned the idea that you want to know the applications running the servers intended to run. Well, the opposite side comes up when a server comes up and it's it's setting up those services to run. How do you know that that's authorized in the code you want to have? And I wish I had time in my talk earlier to mention this, but but security goes back to the idea that, that you know you need to be able to tr prove who was it who committed that code. Do you, you know did they have author were they authorized to have that? The supply chain conversation is really uh, um, actually it's very exciting for someone who who's been just you know trying to evangelize the risk you know, the risk process we have to go through, and and, and this provenance conversation and attestation is so much better in a world where all talking together, making these bridges. Yeah, this this model in terms of uh, the, how the open source community is adopting, um, you know, certificates signing and code signing uh, is a very much evolving story. You know, we're having new standards come out um, and we're starting to implement those things in the Kubernetes project. Uh, we have an entire special interest group, you know, devoted to being concerned with the entire surface of security for the project. Uh, and that requires those folks to be involved and talk with all sorts of people, right? You know, when we're talking about shifting security more left in the process, uh, we're also talking about the folks with the specialties in the field of security and the subfields there, uh, whatever, you know, esoteric knowledge that they're bringing to help take context and, uh, and improve what you were operating on. It, it, we're talking about those people bringing that context to conversation with people and actually expanding the scope of what you care about, right? Um, I think that I've I've experienced being on a lot of software teams where there is nobody with the ownership or existing knowledge of the things that actually matter for the security attack surface of your application uh, and the systems that you're running, right? Um, I, I'm always splitting up that word because I think that often we can become very uh, unaware of the symbiotic nature of the application and the system that it's a part of. Um, you know, we think of these things as separate, but they're very they're very intertwined. Uh, and when you're talking about security, uh, that need typically is weaved through the configuration of the application and the thoughts of how you built it. And um, you know, it's like, okay, well, we want, we want to put this new endpoint up on this infrastructure, right? Well, what are we going to do about auth, right? Um, and there's two halves of that. It's how do we tell who people are and how do we authorize them to do what, you know, what they're able to do? And um, who has the specialty for that, right? And so when, you, when we want to bring that, um, you know, kind of security expertise into that conversation, you're shifting it left and... Um, you know, you have to find somebody who can either get certified, you know, or go and learn about those things. And when you take that back to the open project, right, now you have nobody that's paid to do that, uh, potentially. Uh, there's no sponsorship, you know, like no one has the need for that because they're using it on private infrastructure. And then the project grows and it grows and it's got more users and so there's a there's very much a growing need there uh, and i think that sig security is doing a great job awesome thank you all um i just want to take one second to remind our audience just in case we've had some people join since we started um, of how to ask questions so if you join our slack channel uh, which is titled Panel Discussion. It's DevOps, the SEC is silent, and just post your questions in, in the Slack channel. Um, they can be asked to our um, our wonderful panelists. Uh, was there anything, I didn't mean to cut you all off, was there anything that you all wanted to add, anything that anyone else wanted to add um, on that last question before we moved on? 
Well, there's something probably something I want to add. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. To. Sorry, sorry, yeah. a little bit of delay. Um, yeah, to your point that uh, you know, security is like interweaved in all the teams, and there's a lot of like teams just like operating on their own little little island. Like I've I've seen I've seen a bunch of large enterprises or just like larger companies that have smaller teams doing smaller things. It's very you know important that the other teams understand. I think I alluded that, to that a bit earlier, but you know, like making sure everybody understands what they need. Um, but then security. I think there's a lot of education that needs to be done from security to all the, all the teams. And it's just, yeah, ultimately it's about um, sharing the knowledge, share, making sure everybody understands what their part of the pie is, so to say. And then, um, yeah, it makes it makes the whole collaboration a bit easier. If I could ask both of you, because uh, I'm coming from, you know, being in that security role and why, you know, we have the mindset, oh, we have security training every year. We, we're trying to educate, you know, I don't want to ask how many times either of you have been to a, you know, how to securely code training class in your careers, but how can security teams, so I think what I feel is missing is is the lack of empathy, the understanding of what are the developer challenges, what are the, the, the designer challenges, what are the PM challenges, what are the operation challenges to, to speak toward that training, towards specifics of what the security items are in that world versus just a blanket statement. I think that's part of the disconnect. And, so your so teams yeah. don't want to be a department No, how do we change that so if you're doing like a one year thing like every year we have one like big security training that's not going to change anything if you want to change people's behavior you need to be engaged often the same as you have like a normal uh, life cycle right just like sit down with them have regular meetings and regular catch-ups like hey can you show me your code can you show me your this and uh, you know, like, why is this doing this? Or could you explain to me why you've made this decision and and, and attack it attack it like that in that sense? Like making sure that you're part of the conversation earlier rather than, because you know how it goes. So like if, if, if somebody says like, oh, we're having mandatory security training, people will just go skip through it and then it will be forgotten. If you really want to influence change, then you need to influence behavior. <laughs> and you can't yeah. do like in the healthy habits. In a previous life, I may have, you know, found the JavaScript function that allows you to skip to the end of the video in a security training, and I may have shared that with my team. Um, and you know, you just run it 250 times, and then you know that's 12 more engineering hours for you to work on your sprint. Um, because I care about security, right? And we're going to figure out, you know, what what makes sense for our team. Uh, and uh, that was an environment where the security training was very much focused on helping people not get fished, right? Um, but I don't think I've ever attended um, any kind of corporate sponsored security training for intended for somebody building systems. Um, is that what you were asking, David? Because I, I've not personally experienced that. It is, and, and this goes... If you're anything in PCI or healthcare or financial services, the federal space definitely, you're going to have requirements. Like PCI specifically calls out, I think, in Section 6, where it goes into you must have security training for your developers. And that's one of the things that's tested and checked on. And I think it's an interesting to note also, I mentioned this in my talk, but VMware and Forrester did a, uh, some research recently. It just came out, in a, and I'm sure someone can share this on the Slack channel. Uh, but it was a it, the study that goes into the, the DevSecOps disconnect. and, and how is this breaking down? And they even actually went the other way too, trying to say that developers and the product teams need to understand what are the security people trying to say and trying to help with that that shared communication goes both ways there. But there is definitely a, a, a you know this big push is out there. But I, I I think we were we're iterating. We're doing that extreme programming methodology where we're, we're we've done the tests. We found out it's not working. We're trying to iterate and how do we how do we go to that next stage? And I think that's really what I think. I'm excited about for myself is the next year or two and seeing how that changes, especially with these new models that are presented today and, and, and other conferences around the whole DevOps loop is is really more 3D and more more parallel and, and not just a singular track too. Yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about this uh, point that you mentioned that I wasn't aware of, which is that uh, some of these compliance requirements require uh, teams of devs to get security training. Uh, what sorts of things are included in that sort of curriculum? So I'm gonna go off the top of my head here. So I mean, I'd be inclusive, but to me, generally your OWASP top 10, you know, being familiar with them, you know, if you go through SQL injection, cross-site scripting, stored cross-site scripting, the, the the type of attacks that are, are known to cause compromises, 
It's a program mm -hmm. to train developers on those methodologies. Because these would be in PCI, like you're programming applications to process card data. So it, would, it wouldn't be like a, sh well, yeah, a shopping cart fits into it. So if you're a level one provider, it would fit in, into there. If you're a level one merchant, but it, it applies to anyone doing credit cards. And that's where it fits. If you go into banking, you have uh, mm -hmm. the FFIEC, they have their standards that says how you educate and train and do risk management within the enterprises there. Uh, it, they're, they're defined that. And, if anyone's curious, I can I can share some of the details. But if you just go to PCISecurityStandards.org, you can download the DSS. It's Section Six. It goes into it. Um, it's been a couple of years since I was a QSA, so I'm, I'm fairly certain it's Section Six. I'm fascinated by this uh, because I've never been in an environment where I've had to take uh, any classes that expose me, uh, you know, like to those ideas in a formal environment. Uh, but I've taken a very non-traditional path to. Um, you know, through infrastructure and, and cloud and development. Uh, and uh, those sorts of resources, you know, I've wanted to be available for my teammates so many times. Um, and I'm wondering now how, like, uh, how we shipped APIs and products on previous teams in a PCI compliant way, because <laughs> I didn't, I was not in those classes. Um, well, Dominique, the, you're not inside VMware, so I, you know, I can't help you with that too much. But within VMware, we do have our own programs around these. Uh, and, and if you do more on the services side, where there's SOC audits and other things that go on our actual running services we provide. In HashiCorp, you have some interesting, I mean, your, your business is really on this space. So I'm, I'd am i love oh, to hear. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is yeah. you're essential to every customer I talk to. Well, I, I, like, I like hearing that kind of stuff. No, yeah, it's true. Like most of the customers I speak to, pretty much every practitioner, like the, you know, like PCI um, compliance and, and, and FIPS compliance and, and um, I don't, all these acronyms and all that kind of stuff. But it's so important to the organizations that use our software. We have to be, you know, like there's the whole, we have a whole security model um, section on our website, I believe, um, which with all of the, the accreditations and all of the, compliance and, 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 you know, just this morning, one of my colleagues was asking like, hey, um, do we have like, a, um, you know, for, for this RFP, do we have this, um, <laughs> this security um, certificate or something like that? Sorry, I'm, I'm not really uh, giving any, <laughs> any valid uh, details. But the thing is, like, for some of the stuff that we, uh, for some of the infrastructures and some of the, the systems that our software touches, if we are not secure before it gets shipped like it's you know it's it's going to cause us a lot of problems I, like it's um <laughs> you know like a lot of a lot of companies are going to be very angry and upset if something like that happens but to be fair our security team are a bunch of really really smart people um we get regular catch-ups about like uh, uh recent vulnerabilities and and how we handle things and and can't go into into in too much depth because that's I think confidential, but like we get regular updates about this and as a whole company, it's not just for people who use our stuff, but literally everybody gets the updates and I think that's that's that that helps with um understanding what can go wrong. Um but also for every single person and un like understanding what happens if you have access to certain um certain um, Git repositories or certain uh, other type of systems. Like there's, there's all kinds of weird stuff that can, uh, uh, you know, go wrong. <laughs> Does that answer your question at all? This is very, um, very um, uh, if I don't have stuff written down, I can go all the way from left and right <laughs> and center. So I'm sorry about that. <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Yeah, I think that you were answering uh, what David was looking for pretty clearly and that like what's HashiCorp's kind of approach uh, and attitude uh, when working with people who have PCI requirements and that sort of thing. And um, it sounds like the, the team there is pretty um, active and engaged in making sure that oh, folks yeah. are know what's going on. But um, yeah, it's a definitely education is, is a huge part of making sure that you are keeping security front and center uh, in the application development process. Uh, you want to make sure that people are empowered to attain the skill set uh, necessary to be to be thinking about you know threats and and vulnerabilities uh, when implementing solutions to business problems. And um, 
and, and that can be pretty weird, you know, like as a dev, you're, you're just trying to build some cool stuff. And like, now, why do I have to include all of these keys and certs and, you know, like register <laughs> yes. this system with that thing? Like that's, that's not fun. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. But I think, I think the way that our security teams are actually positioning it, they actually give examples of this is what can go wrong, you know, and it will take mm -hmm. examples from the real world. Like, Hey, uh, this vulnerability, this with this company, and this were the uh, were the, uh, the implications of this. This is all the things that can go wrong if we don't do the right thing. And also for mm -hmm. us talking to customers, if we don't, if we as our employees, every single person in our company, if one person does something wrong and somebody gets wind of it, then we lose all of our, um, you know, then we won't be compliant anymore. Therefore, we can't work with some of the larger customers that we have, and it just all snowballs into there. So. I feel like at HashiCorp, there's a fairly good understanding throughout different departments, who is responsible for what and why. And I think we all do our part, making sure that we are all compliant. <laughs> I think it's this also great. important. Oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I know Dominique has to head out. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I want to thank, thank you, thank Dominique, you so, much. so much for uh, for being here. And we will join you at DevOps Game soon. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I will be seeing you shortly. Yeah, absolutely. Lee, I'm sorry you were saying. Actually, it was, it was David going to say. But, oh, it's um, David. I'm sorry. But I think it, it follows well into that, that, that um, it's an interesting conversation because, uh, Lee, your, your world, you did a lot of open source projects. So that world is all volunteer. And, you know, I, I organize an annual volunteer security conference. We get about 400 people to it. But it, it's a lot of work to to harangle volunteers to do anything, let alone more than that, what they want to do in their volunteer time. But they're not alone. If you, instead of an enterprise, instead of the corporate sponsors for some of these projects, we do have the teams to help you. And I, w I wish Dominique could have stayed a little bit longer because I, I think that she mentioned a couple of times, her security teams are really good. Here at VMware, our security teams are very good. We have some great partners who are both in the product side, working with the Spiffy Inspire and with the other products that are actually part of the Zero Trust or other models, but also our mm -hmm. internal security teams. And no matter what you're doing in your in your environment, uh, internally you have somebody you can reach out to, and you're not on your own. You know, the training's great, but the goal I think I would hope would not be to say we're going to shift it all after you're on your own. Now you've had the training. It's not meant to be that way. I think it really is meant to be a collaboration, and we all need to be part of that discussion. And, and it's important to to say you know I may not know what the risks are, what the threat models are for what I'm working on. I can bring this team or this other person here can, can look at it from a red team perspective and say, well, I'm using this API, it's accessible from these places, we can do these models of security around it. Because not only is it our software, which our customers are using, but the infrastructure around it and the controls are completely different. You know, who, who would have thought that we would have had the dynamics of network policies, we can actually do down to individual pod communications and say, you're allowed to talk or not. And, and I don't know if developers are always of the mindset to leverage those controls unless someone says, hey, this is a great control, because if you're going to add that control, you need to add a test to make sure it doesn't break later when, when something else changes. So you don't want to add a feature and go, oh, we didn't know the network control was there. How do we map that? So yes, I've, uh, so instead of just taking over the whole, whole part of the conversation, I mean, wait, how do you see we can, you know, is that, do you see a dynamics in any of the open source side, or is it really more in like a, a you know, corporate sponsor where you have the resources of other teams available who aren't volunteered? I do think that uh, in a more mature project like Kubernetes, which is a completely different animal than the majority of open source projects, that uh, you know we've got a solid foundation uh, for getting the answers to the questions that you need. Uh, we have a place for people to get security review of security sensitive code. You know, CDEs are handled with very mature protocol. Uh, but when you start you know, kind of getting into those smaller projects, the fewer contributors, uh, the less diverse the skill set that's available, um, it can get really difficult. Um, you know, I certainly bring uh, a lot of that experience into some of the smaller projects that I work on, and, uh, you know, we can hold ourselves to that standard, but you can't do what you don't know. And um, so I do think that there is. Um, you know, and, and it's not it's not just open source, right? You know, the smaller the team that you work on, the smaller company that you're with, um, things can start to get a little bit dicey from a security perspective if you don't have the people on the floor uh, available to always be thinking uh, and considering uh, those problems. I'm sure that you've seen that many times 
uh, David. Oh yeah, yeah. Lots yeah. of startups. So you know, it's always the question: When do you hire your security person? You have to hire your programmers. Your you have to get the things working. But I think I saw a question on Slack. Maybe we can, it'd be a great point to actually address yeah. that question. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, so Carlos asked, um, is there any point in a project that uh, it's too early to think about security or is security first? And I, I'll, I mean, if, if you, I mean, that's really kind of a continuation of your own thought there. You know, from my point of view, you know, I'm a little biased. I'm a security person. But I, I, I do know that over the last 30 years, every team I've worked on has wished they were more involved with the, the application design process as early as possible because realistically the security team is there to support the business to help reduce risk identify risk mitigate risk and control the, and protect the customer data so that nothing happens to it and if you look at why is the business and business to begin with and why the application developed is to support that business also so if we're if we have a, a business is starting they're creating a new product around that business and they've not included security from the beginning they are missing that one persona that's important. You know, every every persona on a team has a, a, a valid element. You know, you, if you're designing a product, but you're not involved in your marketing or your sales teams, how are you developing something that you know can sell? You know, engineers on their own are great, but they don't have that that point of view. Security is the same sort of thing. You, you can't start it too early. And when I was before I joined Pivotal, I was with a startup bank in Manhattan, and I was the first employee. You know, so yes, their security was hired first, but it was a bank. I will say it's a different mindset for a lot of things, but you, you need to at least have, if you, if you can't hire a security, dedicated security person in the very beginning, you need to at least have external resources, some sort of risk analysis person, someone who's done development in a, a risk or threat-based environment, someone who's you know, done, done card-based applications or been part of those training and at least knows the threats and knows how to build into the application those hooks for the security team. How are they gonna monitor for security events in the application? A good example is you might be doing input validation, which Lee, I'm sure you've done in your code, you do input validation, but do you log the output that and it's such a mechanism that you actually can monitor that. So if someone's actually breaking an application, they're gonna fuzzy an application. It's gonna be very noisy if you're monitoring for input validation errors. And, and if you're watching the observability, you're watching the system and automating that, and also you see this huge spike of millions of failed input validation attempts, you know it's not a user, you know something's happening and that, that hook into the security team would not happen if you didn't design it from the very beginning. Yeah, that's actually a great example um, that highlights a, another part of this I wanna talk about, um, which is th that these disciplines don't live in isolation. Um, I agree, it's never too early to be considering the security implications of whatever problem you're trying to solve. Uh, whatever app you're trying to build, a uh, solution you're delivering. Um, but I do think it's always possible to start security poorly. Um, you know, many, in the same way that many devs aren't security professionals, you know, uh, many devs aren't continuous delivery professionals, uh, many security people are not usability professionals, right? <laughs> they don't understand how to make things that people actually want. Right, and, uh, and this is a huge problem uh, because you can secure yourself into a position where the thing that you create is a chimera of non-usable junk. And, um, and so it's important for people to work together, but that begs the question, like how can we get enough resources to start our project? And uh, you're in that system of really suboptimal trade-offs you know, at that point. I think it's, it's hard to bootstrap things. It's hard to build good, meaningful things uh, when you cannot know everything that you need to, uh, and uh, such is life, right? But uh, yeah, with, with that form validation thing, right? Uh, there's the requirement for you to even have the infrastructure available to do the monitoring necessary to instrument the monitoring and educate the developer to do that, you know? And then it's like, what's reasonable in terms of like what you do wanna watch and monitor and observe? And why is it even possible to submit millions of requests, you know? Maybe that should have been a conversation about the, you know, the API's rate limits with the security and the, you know, developer uh, uh, interests there. And, um, you know, there's, there's like a whole, a whole world of things that are, are intermingled. And um, so, you know, the, the crux of the question, is it too early? No, you know, uh, if you can get that outside opinion on your small project, um, say you're, you're building something fresh and new, 
it's great to know somebody uh, who understands what you're trying to do, uh, can really empathize with what you're delivering, and can still give you that opinion on like, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't expose that endpoint to the outside world on this unsecure protocol that you didn't know about, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not that developers have ever done that in the past before. So it never happens. No, there's always a password that's defaulted. You know, so <laughs> it's always it's good. It's secure. Uh, I will say it's nice with with the modern infrastructures and orchestration uh, control planes, especially looking at how um, the demo that was done earlier today on on the Tenzu uh, Community Edition. You know, the idea that you can just take Cert Manager, throw it in, and every app that you deploy by default would be secure. You know, the, the mindset we're starting nowadays is let's take those complex things, make it a little easier, so that it just becomes a non-brainer. And, and the next generation who's going to come behind us, they're just going to take it for granted. That's just the way you do it. So I'm really excited about this this shift in the way we're doing things and where it's going to lead us to in the next couple of generations of programmers. Well, not just programmers, yeah. but everybody's a programmer, the whole team of people who are involved with it. Exactly. Yeah. Really the best practices we're learning now will be the norm coming up. So. Yeah, Sorry, really Lee. interesting thing. Uh, no, no, absolutely. You're saying the same thing that I was going to say, which is uh, that the, the, a great example of that is web technologies, right? Some web APIs now, uh, like WebRTC and all the things we're doing with streaming, uh, the newer protocols like HTTP 2 and 3, like those things just aren't even usable without TLS, you know, the, the encryption and security wrapping those connections now. Uh, and that comes from uh, an ecosystem of security conscious devs and platform builders, um, you know, trying to make sure that the next cool tech that people want to use uh, is done in a good way, in a safe way. And I find that really interesting. Um, but yeah, you know, you want to build the platforms and the tools, uh, you know, when you're talking about Cert Manager with Tonsu Community Edition um, that enable people to get to encryption, you know, uh, and maybe then we get to the point where, hey, I want to deploy my app and I just annotate it with the needs that it has so that the infrastructure fulfills those things. Uh, and when you get to this like metadata and labeling world, when you get away from hard coding static IP addresses and subnets and networks, and you can start annotating the application with the data that it that is about it, you know, and let the infrastructure mm -hmm. fulfill those needs. You get to this cloud native world where uh, suddenly you have a lot less friction in the security space. And uh, that's a nice place to be for sure. Yeah. And, um, Christy, did, you, did we want to move on to another topic here? <laughs> yeah, we can, we can hit, move on to the next question. Um, okay, so what is it that you reckon security people want from DevOps? It feels like we don't treat them as customers enough and at best try to explain to them how they should do their job better, which as you know, is may not be a great approach. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and start. So from, from just my own history of what I've wanted from the development teams and the product teams and the actual mm -hmm. business around things is, is one that we need to start off thinking about things from what is the data, you know, that, you know, if we're gonna talk about zero trust or any model, what are you protecting? Why are you protecting it? And how are you protecting it? And, and apply those to whatever we're doing. It's, it's just almost a, an everyday life conversation. You know, if, you're, if you've got something that's important to you, it's your core of your business. How do we get everyone, you know, because everyone is, is concerned about this. I don't know any developer who wants to have insecure code that they published. You know, that, that's their name, that's their brand. They don't want to be associated with, oh, I wrote the API that had Equifax Act. You know, not, they don't want that in their history. Now, it's a great learning experience and we all learn and grow from those things. So it's not, a, it's not a, I don't want to have, you know, I, I'm a huge believer in a blameless culture. We need to encourage people not to fear identifying I made a mistake or someone else saw, you know, saw something that could be a problem. But it really is, um, it really is the mindset that everyone acknowledges that we are part of the system and, and the security teams don't want to say no. They want to enable the business, but we need to recognize what is the data, what's at risk, and how we're protecting it. Yeah, what is the what does the security person want from the DevOps team or from a DevOps culture shift? Um, we I, I want to understand the question here a little bit. Uh, it feels like we don't treat them as customers. Is is that um, is that the security folks treating the DevOps folks as customers, or what do, what do you think? 
That's yeah. how I interpret it because because remember also that every part of this is a product. So if if the if the DevOps lifecycle is a product, or if the pipeline's a product, you know, the, you know, if the if the applications are product, or the infrastructure is a product, then there are customers for those applications. I think it it can be t- taken both ways. When when I talked about in my talk was the idea that you know the security team is a customer for the application that is being developed in the same way that the the controls and tests that are being done by an application from a governance and security point of view, those can, the developers are the customers of what the security teams are asking those teams to make. So it, it is both sides, but I was thinking it was more the developers as the customers of the security team. Yeah, I, it, it really takes me back to my time at a smaller company, but with one of the larger products that I've worked on, uh, was when I was working with the Beatport team. Beatport's an online music store, you know, serves half a million DJs, uh, you know, back when we were running that infrastructure. And um, there was no security org, you know, at a hundred person company, right? Um, But we did have an infrastructure team. And I compare what the experience of that was like to when I was working in a telco IT operations environment, right? where we did have a, a very uh, enfranchised security organization that owned many more things than just application development lifecycle, right? The security with re- respect to the software that we as a company were building. And uh, those were very different environments to operate in, right? And with this kind of sweet spot of a more medium-sized person company, the ownership of the security needs uh, were kind of completely encompassed in the infrastructure group, you know, which was me and several other engineers. Uh, and we were very embedded in the software development process and in the design of the systems that we were going to be building, developing, and then deploying and supporting. And that was a really good place to be because if, you know, Taylor or I, you know, thought that there were things that needed to be considered with a new API feature or this reach out to a payment processor or whatever, you know, we could make sure that the infrastructure was lined up for that and we could bring our security knowledge to the table when we talked with the development teams, right? But that sort of tight feedback loop wasn't so much in place uh, when I was in the telco environment, right? We were in uh, in a place where there were like bi-monthly reviews, Right. And that and that was a very kind of push pull conversation because the culture gets a little bit sideways on you and there's constraints and resources. And I think that what security wants from DevOps, you know, is that as you quicken the pace of application development and you're including these other concerns about infrastructure and as you're starting to attest you know, identities on your builds and make sure that things are moving faster so that stuff gets out of the way, that security doesn't get out of the way, right? Um, that you still have the processes and places and checks uh, that you need so that you're shipping not just confidently that your application logic is correct, not just confidently that your infrastructure is available and ready to serve the number of requests that it needs, but that also the application serves the threat model of the problem that you're trying to solve, the people that you're trying to serve, the people that you're trying to protect your data from, uh, and that you're doing that in a way that is that, that people can keep tabs on, right? And so in that small environment, Right, our CIO was able to keep tabs on things, <laughs> right? Because he owned the infrastructure group um, from a responsibility perspective. And, um, you know, I don't know who owned uh, security in that previous uh, environment I was in, in the much larger, you know, monolith of things. I was much earlier in my career, uh, and the processes. Uh, had a lot more friction and, and things moved a lot slower. Uh, that's that's the feel that I get. Um, I think I can probably speak with less education about a large org uh, than I can a small one or an open source one. Yeah. All right. This is a this is a oh, good sorry, question because um, I think 
that when we consider culture and DevOps, we always want to be thinking about incentives, right? Like what, is, what incentivizes people to, to do their job, to work with this person, to treat people nice, you know, to work with each other, to cross an organizational boundary. And uh, when we think about DevSecOps, right, including security in the conversation of shifting concerns left so that we get collaboration earlier, uh, how do you incentivize that culture shift, right? I don't think of these people uh, or these needs as different in my head, right? I'm, I'm trying to think, how do we get folks to work better together? Because there's no way that every one person can know all of the things necessary to do the application development life cycle, right? But that if we can all talk and share our concerns and communicate, then you can get to DevSecOps. Um, and yeah, it's, it's harder for me to envision like why there should be a customer relationship until you come into that problem with a pre-existing org structure, right? And then you can get into conversations about the efficiency models of different organizational structures and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, that's... Well, Lee, you brought up what th something that really is uh, an interesting sticking point for me is, is how do we, the incentivization part, you know, it, it's developers have different incentives than your SREs, which have different incentives than your security teams. And typically security teams have end up using the incentive of a mandate. You must do or your job could be affected type thing, which I think we all know threats don't get anyone motivated. It just makes them get, you know, it, it, it turns into a, a hostile work environment. People will, you know, you're not, it's a total opposite of a blameless culture. People are afraid of mentioning anything as a problem because they don't want to be impacted with that threat. So how can we get to a blameless culture first? Because you need to have that first so everyone's open and honest. But secondarily, how do we get these different teams who are incentivized for different results? You know, the ops team is, is incentivized for uptime and you know, upgrade, mean, mean, you know, the meantime failure problem and, and how, how, how quickly things are, are, are patched, which overlaps a little bit with security because they're also incentivized by the, you know, the meantime for upgrading, you know, how, how long CVs live there, the, the risks that they're, that they're identifying, uh, but the developers are not incentivized for either of those. And, and I think that's a huge disconnect, not just in, in companies I've, I've worked with, but it's a global problem. How do we you know, get, get all these teams excited to work together? Because once we work together, I, I've rarely seen anyone who, once they make friends with each other, it doesn't build better relationships and everyone wants to support each other. And, but it's that, it's that breaking of the ice and getting, getting past that first stage where everyone's like, I, I just have to get through my sprint this week. I need, the, as you said earlier on training, I got 12 more hours of time I can code. You know, I get, I, I can focus on my problem more, but it, we need to balance that because I think that the, the concern I have is, as a developer, they're incentivized for the number of features they can get out, the number of lines, you know, how many check in, you know, how many times they check in, a, 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 you know, the PRs, how, how, how fast are they meeting those, those uh, objectives that they've defined in, in both their, their sprints and their, you know, management reviews which are not part of this team of, of the world that they're part of now. How do we change that structure? Which I think is a corporate change. It's, it's how do we, because part of it involves pay, part of it involves time to actually work together. Uh, but but I don't know what that the end state looks like. And it's hard to, to figure out what those next steps could be to make that incentivization where everybody wants to do this. Yeah, this is this is good. I um, You remind me actually of uh, some times that I've experienced security feeling really fun uh, and magical. Uh, when you actually mentioned Cert Manager and that whole kind of stack of complicated tools that you need to glue together on top of Kubernetes in order to get to the point where you annotate your app with one line of code and then you get a TLS certificate on a domain wildcard or whatever, right? Like that's awesome and that feels good. It's awesome if your ops-centric folks you know, on whatever software delivery team you're working with are able to deliver that sort of platform capability to you. Um, but I think that that almost feels more, you know, because like now you've got a TLS stream, you can do H2 over that or H3 or whatever you want, uh, you know, from your applications um, capabilities. And maybe, you, you know, you're teams can get you that capability in local dev too. So there's an incentive there for the dev to potentially care about having a secured connection to a server so that you can you know, ship bits around 
on a, you know, it, now the technology has gotten out of your way and you did that in, in a way that you didn't have to file a ticket for. You just pushed code up to a repo and it, and it happened. Uh, and so somebody bringing that infrastructure and security knowledge to the CI and continuous delivery pipeline, uh, that's awesome. And it reminds me of something that's much harder to get devs to learn about and care about, um, which is being concerned about the implementation details of security um, in your code. And it reminds me of a time when we had a really nice pipeline and we put sonar queue into it. And there was a lot of friction here because the lead dev on that project, you know, he's like, oh, well, okay, this is going to increase our build times. And also now what if this thing's like not tuned properly? It seems to be shouting at us a lot. You know, it's like, well, I mean, there are potential vulnerabilities in your front end code and back end code here. You know, like we let's talk about them. Okay, let's bring that up with the CIO. Okay, let's let's talk about this a little bit more. Oh, we don't like this. Oh, but now it's found a problem that was actually an implementation bug, right? So it's finding bugs, not just security issues. Okay, well, like let's keep using this. And several months go along, you know, and we still have Sonar Cube in the pipeline, and it's causing friction because maybe the way it was glued in, you know, was causing availability problems with the CI pipeline. But overall, it's there and it's delivering values and and the number of bugs that we're putting in the code and the number of vulnerability issues that are potentially there is going down. And that feels good. So what, what can we learn from that? Like, what, what changed in the incentives there? Because there, there are things there that devs don't normally care about. And mm -hmm. we, we got to a point where we could all work together and resolve issues and then make tickets around those things. And so I think um, I went through a phase several years ago where I was really kind of nerding out, studying habits, incentives, and tools. What's the relationship between our habit forming and our tools? And I think that when we look at DevOps, you know, and we had Kat talk about the history of CICD earlier, a lot of it was very tool centric, right? Behaviors changed, people created new tools, behaviors change on those new tools, people create new tools, right? And so we iterate with each other. And I think that's a lot of this iteration uh, is happening in the industry, in the cloud native space uh, with our security tools, things like Falco. Um, you know, we have entire companies being built around security with Sysdig and Aqua, uh, Black Duck, et cetera. And um, when you can provide tools that slip into that same world view that continuous integration and delivery give you, uh, then you give people a place and an opportunity and an incentive to collaborate together, identify issues, and then give them a name with a URL. Right, like, oh, th this code issue like has a problem, and I can link to it, and I can I can say like at somebody and be like, hey, I have no idea what this means. You know, can we talk about it at the next stand up? You know, and yeah. there, the, if I could, you know, yeah, if I could yeah. jump in there for a second because because you brought something that, that I think is a key to this this friction here. You installed Sonar Cube, and it added friction because now you had to go and see were these vulnerabilities false or, or not. And that is really what I think is, is the core of what I'm feeling this incentivizing conversation needs to get to is we're asking developers now to stop working on a feature or a release to do this iteration of validation of the, of the test results. So how do we get the, the security test to be like any other validation test that would happen in the release cycle where it gets kicked back to the developer? Because if you, if you fail a functional test in a release of code, it gets kicked back to you. You don't go, oh my God, it's friction. You go, oh, I, I had a bug. I got to fix it and release it. If a security test comes up, you know, it, it, it's it's partially that that mindset, that friction, and that's what I, I'd love to get the key of us. Is that I've seen it in a lot of places. Unless you're, you know, a lot of places solve this by mandating it, by saying you must fix these things if there's a certain level, and then, but then mm -hmm. that that definition of is it really true or not? You need to have that partner in security because you might get an alert that say like a bug from a functional test. You know how to fix that. That's in your code. But a security issue, you don't really know how does you know how does I might be using you know this Python library that you know XML that has a problem, but am I secure? Well, the security professional or partner you would have would say, well, you need to look at the 
the usage of that library using this function that said mm -hmm. this is, is vulnerable. And the developer goes, oh, no, I'm not. And they go, oh, it's a false positive for our mindset. But that we need to, that's the friction I'm, I'm wanting to figure out. How do we incentivize around that so that developers aren't hit with a negative impact for working on a failed test from security versus a failed test from a, a functional test? Yeah. And Guys, I, I, thank you. I think uh, we're out of time. Yeah. I'm sorry. Sorry. We are, <laughs> we are. Uh, no, this was a great, great discussion, though. And thank you both so much for, for being a part of it. Um, it was fantastic. Um, just want to invite everyone over to DevOps Games uh, for the party games after this, starting right now. And then we'd also love to have your feedback on this event. There's a link to a survey in the announcements channel, and you'll also get that by email. So please take a few minutes to share um, your thoughts with us. And then lastly, all of the recordings um, of this session, plus all of the other sessions that happen throughout the day, are going to be available on devopsloops.io on October 6th. So be sure to check them out. Um, thanks everyone again for attending and we'll see you at DevOps Party Game.